I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. This week I'm speaking to garden designer, writer and podcast host Rachel McCartane. Rachel believes the garden should work for you, that it should suit your lifestyle. If you struggle to reconcile the garden you want with the time that you have to spend on it, this is the episode for you. Whether you have your own garden or you create gardens for others, Rachel's advice will no doubt prove useful. I am not, uh, I think, probably what could be classed as your average or archetypal garden designer um, in the sense that I sort of fell into it simply by necessity um, when I acquired a garden. But I'd grown up in horticulture. My father had um, a nursery uh, and was growing um, all through my sort of teenage years. So my Saturday jobs were spent weeding and watering and pricking out and potting on and getting up orders and loading up the lorry and doing all the really boring, horrible horticultural jobs. And I absolutely hated gardening. And I wanted nothing to do with anything to do with horticulture in my life, having gone to university. That was it. You know, plants were just, as far as I was concerned, something that was dull and horrible and involved getting wet and cold or standing in a, in a greenhouse and getting hot and sweaty. So I just didn't want to do anything to do with it. So I went and did a business studies degree um, at Brighton and then went and worked for BMW for about 10, 12 years, um, selling selling cars around the country and selling to corporate uh, companies and doing presentations and being very corporate and all the rest of it. And then I bought my first house, which had a garden. Um, And the, the previous owners hadn't actually set foot in the back garden for seven years. So the grass was up to your waist. It had bindweed up to the tops of the trees. It was just a complete mess. So I thought to myself, well, that's fine. I I know what plants are. I can tell, you know, a difference between this one and that one. And I know exactly what what to put in the garden as I started clearing it. And then suddenly realized I didn't know how to make a garden. I knew what the plants were, but I didn't know how to to actually create a garden that worked for me and over the time over the you know few years then I've moved to a different house and done different gardens and friends have then asked me to do their garden or can I help them and then people came and said could you actually design a garden for me and I've sort of fallen into it that way um so I would class myself as being a pragmatic and practical garden designer as opposed to being an artistic garden designer if that makes sense Mm, definitely and off the back of that I think uh, probably that's what inspired you to write your book Um, so can you just talk a little bit about that and it's it's not your average garden design book either so yeah maybe you could talk about kind of where you're coming from with with the book well yeah again I you know, one of the main problems that people have always said to me about gardening and, and, and garden design is that they don't know much about plants. And they look in books and they look in magazines for inspiration. But everything that, that they saw, and indeed I saw, were, were of these amazingly beautiful gardens. They were full of incredible plants. They were very complicated. They obviously took a lot of time and effort and energy. And it bore no relation to the type of garden I saw outside my my back door. I mean, I was never going to be able to create a garden that looked like that. I was never going to be able to afford to create a garden that looked like that. And so I sat there thinking, well, how how can you create a garden? How can you make a garden work for you if you don't know much about plants because the average person doesn't really know a huge amount about plants and how how can you go about creating a garden from the perspective of not knowing anything so what questions do you need to know what does a person need to ask of their own garden in order to find the right answers to be able to make a garden that works for you and so that was really the 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 premise for the for the book which 
um, I, I wrote it as, as the, the title was, I want to like my garden because there are so many people that would love to have a better looking garden. They would love to enjoy being in a garden if only they knew how to go about it. And seeing all of these beautiful sort of coffee table garden design books weren't helping. The steps weren't there to take somebody into their own garden and say, this is this is what I need to ask and this is what I need to do. So I kind of sat back and thought, right, if you know nothing about gardens, nothing about plants and nothing about garden design, how could you tell somebody what to do to make their own garden better? And, and that was really how it sort of started. So I would take a very non-gardening perspective and I've always used analogies when uh, for, for me trying to understand how to do things and all through you know if you're at school or various other things like you'd use an analogy to actually understand how you could grasp a complex subject so I, I spent a long time thinking what would be a very suitable analogy for somebody who didn't know about plants to understand how to use plants in the garden and I sort of fell on the idea of, of the garden wardrobe, because most of us know how to get dressed. We put on underwear, we put on clothes. If it's raining, we put on warm clothes or wet weather gear. If it's sunny, we know what to wear. If we're going to somewhere posh and nice, we, we can dress ourselves up. We understand how to use clothes. And I thought, well, how can you do that in the garden? Because that's a way that you could convey how plants work in the garden environment. So I came across this sort of wardrobe and thought, actually, if you assign a job role to a group of plants, people can understand how to use them. So you've got, for example, jeans and jumpers. We've all got those in the wardrobe. We chuck them on all the time. We know they're going to work. And then we dress outfits up by having tops and T-shirts and putting accessories on so I thought if I can actually group plants in those familiar concepts, it will help people work out in their garden what their gardens are like. And in fact, I've got a friend of mine who had asked me to do her garden. And she said, and I said to her, well, how many jeans and jumpers have you got in your garden? And she sort of looked at me rather strangely. And then she walked out and came back in and she went, yeah. That's all my garden is, isn't it? It's just jeans and jumpers. And then she said, all the only things I've got are accessories and they're all multicolours and they just don't go together, do they? And she got it. And I thought, ah, that's probably a very good concept to actually try and convey in a book because people will understand how to, to go about grouping plants together. And with that, then I then looked at thinking, OK, how then could you help people further by giving them a method so that they can group plants together in a space and not crowd too many in and understand how many they've got to have, which is where the boxes mentality, you know, idea came up, which was then if I give each plant a size it's going to grow in five years time, and it's not the shape of the plant, it's the area of space it occupies in the garden then people can actually combine a, a, or create a design by using boxes. And it's a bit like sort of 3D Tetris. You can imagine boxes growing in a certain area. And if you know the plants that will fit in those boxes, then simply working out how many plants you need to put in the garden is a question of counting the boxes. And it's much easier for people to imagine how something will look with a box shape than a plant shape because again it's an analogy it's a familiar sort of concept it's a, it's something that people can understand how to do and so you can give people methodology to be able to design and create their own gardens by using something very familiar yeah they're both very very clever ideas and I think even professional designers will you know, will, would actually benefit from taking a step back and looking at those kind of elements in a garden sometimes because you can get a little bit swept away in, uh, you know, creating something that's really impactful, but just for maybe a shorter period of time. Um, 
But you spoke about, I think, at the beginning, you said, you know, we, we kind of all look at different pictures, um, you know, the gardens on telly, that sort of thing. And we think, oh, that's lovely. I'd like that. But I think there's probably three issues at play there. One of them is, as you said, the budget. Um, I think the other one is maintenance issues. And possibly the third one is kind of this unrealistic expectation of what gardens should look like based on what is portrayed in the media as a really good looking garden. Um, Do you think we kind of need to maybe adjust down our expectations based on what we're pelted with in terms of images and, you know, ideas of what a good garden should look like? I think it's not a question of pairing back. It's a question of actually working out what's suitable for you. I mean, again, you're a designer and I, you know, and and you have clients who you might say to them, well, can you send me a picture of a sort of a garden style that you like? And invariably you get sent this picture of of a garden that probably cost £150,000, has six or seven, you know, full time gardeners looking after it. And they've said to you they want a low maintenance, easy care garden. And you've got this complete disconnect about what is what they think and what and, and what is reality. And. I've always sat there thinking, and again, people come to me and say, oh, well, I, I'd like a contemporary style or an urban style or a cottage garden style, because that's the only information that they've been given. And I think it's what happens is that people look to try and create a garden to suit a style rather than actually think about what the garden needs to do and how it needs to work for them it's like that it's going back to that plant analogy and I said in in my book you know it's that what the garden shape and how you use the garden is the underwear and if your underwear fits well it doesn't matter what you put on top of it because the underwear will hold it in place you just have to decide what the right type of underwear is and so if I, you know, one of the first questions that anyone will come to me and say, if, if they're asking me to do a design and they'll, and they'll say, oh, yes, I want some sort of cottagey garden, it being romantic and this, that and the other. And I say, well, where's your favourite place in the garden to sit? And they said, well, it, well, it's here. And I said, is, is that where the patio is? Well, no, 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 because the sun shines on that part of the garden. It, it gets the last part of the sun at six o'clock in the evening. And I say, well, isn't that really where you would prefer to sit? Well, yes, it is. That's that's the nicest place to sit. So I said, okay, that's where we design the garden from. And it's how you're going to use the garden. So if we put the bones in and the underwear in that makes it a place that they can use, then the garden will work better for them. And I think so much of modern design at the moment is about creating a visual image as opposed to a workable garden. And I think it's really a question of, of, of switching round the, you know, rather than imposing a design on the garden, you've got to actually make the garden fit the person that's using it. The sun is always going to shine in the same part of the garden. You're not going to change that. So by creating something that doesn't utilise what you have, you're creating and building in a problem. And as you said, again, it's all about instant impact, you know, and people have this expectation that the garden is going to look like the picture for 12 months of the year, which it simply isn't going to do. And again, it's trying to, should we say, tone down a little bit their expectations and and of, of instant and saying to them, look, this garden will evolve over time. And, and the way that I've designed and, and what I do it is by giving people a plan and then letting them go away and doing it. So, for example, you know, what they'll get is a blueprint of a design from me, which tells them what plants to use and how to do it and how to lay the garden out. But they have to go away and do it, which means they build the garden over time. And as a result of that, the design that they then adapt and create will be better because they haven't just imposed something on the garden from a picture. It's actually sat there and worked from how they want to use the garden. You know, I walk over there to sit down because that's my spot for a coffee in the morning and that's my spot for a glass of wine in the evening. So I've got to create two seating areas here and there. And then when I've done that, how am I going to get to those seating areas? Do I need a path? Is it easy to get there? And you can build up this 
this this design, the underwear, the bones of the garden, very, very simply, then the style comes from people saying what they want the garden to do and how they want the garden to make them feel. And, you know, when you sort of say to people and if you talk to them in their language, it's sort of very much, well, you know, how do you want to feel? And how do you want to feel? Do you want happy flowers? Oh, yes, I love happy flowers. Do you want do you want to touch? Do you like touching the plants as you walk past? And what you get is is from talking to people in terms of the, the language that they understand, as opposed to saying to somebody, well, we're going to give you a nice cottage style garden and we're going to you know, have this sort of contemporary look here. It's it's a it's a concept most people don't have. They want to know that they can sit in the garden and have a cup of tea and the sun's going to shine and they look at something nice and something that might smell nice. And and that makes a, a good garden for, for, for most people. And I just think it's the fact that garden design has focused too much on the visual artistic elements, you know, the, the show stopping elements. And I think in some respects, it's lost track of actually what people need. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I interviewed a designer called Xanthi White a few episodes back and she was talking about how she allows her clients to express their needs through the garden. Um, and it, I said to her, it almost, I, th- I think I said it after the interview, but I said to her, it's almost as if you're like a therapist. You're kind of drawing out of people what they want from their gardens. And I think you mentioned that in the book as well, the, about the emotional connection between someone and a site. And I th- at the moment, there's a, a movement in across probably all industries and I can't think of the name for it it's something like user-led design or solutions but it's about going to the people who you're designing something for and letting them lead how the the eventual product ends up or or what the output is Um, so I really love that idea of kind of turning design a little bit on its head and, and not just handing people a done deal and saying okay get on with it because when you allow people to be part of that design and creation process that's when they get invested into the site and that's when they become they love it and actually they make small adaptations that make it work for them so I think that's an excellent excellent strategy um but thinking about that there always will be people who say I don't care actually just give me a lovely design stick it in and I want to live with it um there I think sometimes that's where the issue of maintenance comes up so if someone comes to you and says I want a fantastic looking garden uh I want it to be good for wildlife um but I don't want to do any work in it what what do you say to those people well, first, the first question is why? Why would you not actually want to, to, you know, if you've got a garden, there is no no maintenance garden. There is no garden that is, uh, you know, just that looks after itself. Gardens create debris. Gardens, you know, leaves fall down, bits fall over, plants set seed. Um, you will have to do something. So you need to understand why somebody doesn't wants to be involved in in gardening and a lot of it um when you actually begin to sort of should we say delve a little deeper into that idea of what is a main you know why they don't want to be a gardener is first of all they don't think that they're very good at gardening and they might not feel that they're very good because the plants that they put in die or they don't feel that they know enough about plants or the fact that they associate gardening like i Back in my teenage years and when I was at university, for me, horticulture was just horrendous. I was just doing boring stuff all day long. And if you can say to a person, you know, what is it you don't like about gardening? Now, you'll find better answers. They'll say, well, I hate, you know, the mowing. I really can't stand mowing. And there's always the debris and there's always this to clear up. And I I don't like flopping plants. And actually, what the, the, the backstory of that is, is to a large extent that Their perception of what gardening is, is to try and create a garden that they see on the television, in the magazines and in the books. And they just haven't got the time, the enthusiasm or 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 the willingness to go to that extent to create this perfect spectacle, because that's what they think gardening is, creating this dream garden. And gardening isn't that. Gardening is very much about creating the space that works for you and setting your rules. 
and not being beholden to what the books tell you to do. I mean, it's almost that there are, that to some extent people fear that if they don't do things properly, then they're failing. And that's not what having a garden is. So just a little thing, for example, this, this year I decided that I have got to create adaptations to my garden. You know, the climate's changing where I live down here on, in, in the south coast of England, very much so that, that our weather has changed even in the last 10 years. And so I've decided I have to, the plants in my garden have to adapt to the climate and I'm not going to water them anymore. So I still have some plants in pots and I will water those. But once something's gone in the ground for more than 12 months, it should be established and I'm no longer going to water the garden because it's got to now develop and adapt to suit the climate that we've got. Now, yeah, I've had a couple of hydrangeas die on me. Um, my grass is really brown because it hasn't rained for eight weeks where I live. And but that's not a failure. I'm not, should we say, keeping up with this advertiser's construct of what a garden should be. For example, my, my husband said to me the other day, he said that, that we had a, a guy come round from the golf club who said, oh, look, I can, I can come and bring some fertiliser and you can green all your grass up because um, that would look nicer then. And, and I said to my husband, I said, well, how many times have we had to mow the lawn this year? He said, well, not that many. I said, so if we put fertiliser on the grass and it all becomes beautifully verdant and green and this lovely green swathe that we see in all the magazine images, I said, that's just going to create more work for me because I've got to cut the grass every week. And the penny dropped in his eyes and he went, oh, yeah. I said, it doesn't matter that the grass is a bit brown. That's how grass behaves when it's in a drought situation. So if we don't fight the situation, you don't have as much work to do. You, you're not striving for the perfect image. And in talking to customers and clients and, and when you actually say to them, it, it, you know, the garden is yours. It's your environment to maintain as you want, not as the picture says in the magazine. If your lawn has got a couple of daisies in it, does it really matter? You know, there's no garden police going to come round and tell you off. It's, it's your garden to look after in your way. And then all of a sudden, the maintenance of the garden isn't a chore. And that's what a, a significant proportion of people feel is that the tr it's another chore they have to keep up doing in order to keep the garden looking as they feel it should be. And that's simply not the case. And when you have those discussions, people again feel more engaged with their garden. It's their space. It's, it's my little piece. And as I've said to people, you know, your garden will outlive you. So why don't you pass it on to somebody in a better state than, than you received it? It's a responsibility. It's your little piece of the environment to, to maintain the way that you choose. And it doesn't matter that somebody else doesn't choose to maintain it or wouldn't choose to maintain it the same way as you. And that way, if you can take chores out of looking after the garden, people enjoy gardening more. So I'm just thinking to kind of people that I know, people that I've worked with, and sometimes there is this feeling that um, they would like the garden to look nice, but they're, as you say, the, the level of maintenance and time they want to spend in it is not commensurate with the results that they want. Um, so it's sometimes tough to reconcile that. And some people look out their garden window and just go, oh, I can't bear this garden. I cannot bear it. Um, and they'll maybe get someone in once a year to kind of hack it all back and then a year down the line they'll be back to square one um, because I think their need to have a nice garden is outweighed by their need to not want to work in it um, you know how do you kind of reconcile that if someone really doesn't want to go outside they're a really reluctant gardener and yet they kind of expect the garden to look better is there anything you can kind of say to people who've got that that feeling well, I think for, for for me, you need to identify or those people need to identify the chores that they really dislike about gardening. And ultimately, having a low maintenance garden is only low maintenance if the chores that you dislike doing 
are minimised. So every low maintenance garden in that sense is different. Now, for some people, it might be mowing the grass. They can't stand it, in, in which case there are ways that you can, you know, Lo- you know, losing that lawn, that concept of having a lawn, or you can make the lawn easier and quicker to mow because the design is very fiddly. So, for other people, it might be that they that they hate mess. Um, what they d- dislike is stuff constantly dropping on the garden, and they want it to be nice and easy. In which case, things, for example, like having shingle down, is difficult to rake and difficult to to maintain. You need things that you can they can get the blower out and blow everything around and and clear it up that way. So it's finding out what issue the person has with the garden and then looking for ways to mitigate that particular problem. I mean, again, in the book, I sort of said, you know, most gardeners don't plan for debris. And in any garden, you have to plan for what nature is going to do and then find the right materials to suit what nature is going to chuck at your garden in order to minimise the chores that you have. And if anything that we've had from, I suppose, from the lockdown um, this, you know, this year is how important gardens are as a space for individuals to sit out in. Um, And so making your garden more and a more enjoyable place for you to have and to be in without it creating more work and unnecessary work is even more important, which is why, you know, again, from from my book, it's very much trying to show people that you can have a good garden. It might not be what you see on the television, but it will work for you. It will have plants and flowers and it will be full of bees and butterflies and all those things that make being in the garden enjoyable. But you don't have to have as or be as involved in in the chores that you think you need to be in order to have a garden that looks like that. Excellent. Yeah, it's back to solving the particular gardener's problem rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, Yeah, it's very smart. It's a very smart way of approaching it. Um, Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you would like to add in? The only thing I would say, because you were were talking about really reluctant gardeners or or how they could be much more environmentally friendly um and i think something you know about not having you know understanding why bedding plants fail which makes a lot of people think that they're not very good gardeners garden centers 15 20 years ago changed their their sales models from being plant orientated to being supermarket selling models and The idea is not that you necessarily buy the right thing for your garden. It's that you buy something for your garden. And garden centres sell plants and they understood how people walk around and buy plants. And so what they do is they programme you as you walk around a garden centre to consume things. So it's, for example, um, they'll put great blocks of colourful planting in big buy me now offers They'll make instant gardens. Here you are. Here's a hanging basket full of everything ready for you to go. All you have to do is take it home and hang it up. It's instant. It's cheap. It's full of colour. And people take them home and nine times out of ten are disappointed with the result. And they think that it's down to their lack of care that is caused the plants not to perform. And therefore, then they're not very good gardeners and they don't like gardening because they're constantly failing. And it's got nothing to do with that at all. If you, again, taking back the analogy, if you as a plant were, um, you're grown in this perfect commercial environment, you have perfect light levels, perfect water levels, perfect humidity levels, if you're fed whenever you want to, you're, you're grown at, in, in the environment, you're producing more flowers than naturally you would be able to produce. If you're then taken out of that environment and plonked in somebody's back garden, you're going to struggle. Now, things like bedding plants and hanging baskets and these instant potted gardens that garden centres sell people is that they've created 
the plant that the plants are perfect at the point of sale. They're in full flower and they've done everything to get them looking fabulous. Now, if you're perfect at that point, there is only one route, which is downhill from that particular point. So the poor person spends his money, gets them home. There are usually too many plants in the basket or the pot to, for, for the soil that's in that pot to be able to sustain them. They're usually filled with a multi-purpose compost and some slow-release fertiliser. But you can't keep the pots wet enough so that the fertiliser can dissolve and so the plants don't get the food. They're all competing with each other and they can't survive and so they, they fail. And what's then happening now is that people are assuming they go and buy the plants, they get them home, they last for a few weeks, they throw them away. And then they go back again because that's what plants do, don't they? Plants die. So we go back and get some more. And supermarkets and, and the garden centres and DIY stores have, have, have imposed this consumerist model on horticulture, which I personally don't think is sustainable. And I think it's one of the reasons that you know, we have so many problems in the world. It's overconsumption and unnecessary waste. And all the resources that went into producing those plants, the labour, the light, the heat, the water, the chemicals, have gone to waste because the plant dies. But that's fine for the horticultural industry because people come back and buy more. And what I want to do and what I want to try to do with the book is to say to people, you can step off the hamster wheel. You know, I haven't bought bedding plants for 20 years. I use bulbs and I don't have the same gaudy, big, overly showy flowers in my garden, but I have a better garden because of it. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong. If you want to go and buy some pots to cheer yourself up on your patio, that's absolutely fine. But like you say, you, you are on a bit of a hiding to nothing. And same thing with herbs, same thing with houseplants. I think it just takes a little bit of consumer education to realise that actually you could buy a houseplant and you can split it and you'll have 20 houseplants. I just did it with one actually I bought the other day. And and that's fine, That it, but but people don't have that knowledge. And so when you've got that many things crammed in a pot, they're destined to fail and, and it, it's unsustainable and we cannot possibly keep doing it. And so, you know, if, if the industry won't change, then maybe it needs to be led by consumers and they might get the message. But yeah. I, I think I think I think it's very true. I mean, I would always say to people, you know, if, if you're going to buy plants to ask two questions. And the first one is, why am I buying this plant? And the second question is, when it's not in flower, how is it still going to benefit me? And if you're happy with both answers, buy the plant. Some interesting things to consider there about shopping for plants and possibly a question we could ask a variation of every time we buy something. Thank you to Rachel for taking part and thank you to you as well for listening. I hope you can take some of the ideas that Rachel spoke about and implement them in a way that makes your gardening a bit easier. I'm certainly going to go and look at giving my garden a wardrobe makeover. To finish, I'm going to leave you with Dr Ian Bedford talking about the fact that invading species aren't always a bad thing. It's often the case that when a new invasive species appears in the UK, alarm bells ring, particularly when our native ecology could be at risk. The appearance of an invader that turns out to be beneficial to us is therefore rare, but a welcome occurrence. This has been the case with the European species of bumblebee, the tree bumblebee, Bombus hypnorum. First appearing in the UK in 2001, this ginger, black and white-tailed bee has become widespread and is now abundant through most of England and Wales and is an excellent new pollinator species. The tree bumblebee, as its name suggests, appears to prefer woodland habitats, but has adapted well to suburbia, where it nests up high in holes on buildings and trees and often within bird boxes. The nests only last a couple of months, but as the colony develops within, new queen tree bumblebees regularly emerge and disperse. The smaller, stingless males will also emerge, 
but these tend to swarm around the nest entrance, enticing new queens from other nests to fly over and mate. Often the sight of the swarming bumblebees causes concern, but these males are completely harmless and should be left to enjoy their brief but valuable time in our gardens. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All Facebook, Roots and All UK and Instagram, Roots and All Pod But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.